Once again, welcome to another episode of Hot Topics. Can you believe it? This is our first episode for 2021. We are so looking forward to the series as we reflect on 2020 and what was the best of the episodes there. On that note, I think you've already hit the year running and you just forgot to say Happy New Year's to everyone. Yeah, and we really look forward to the journey that we have ahead of us as the Hot Topics um, team and ministry, which includes you at home. Absolutely. So if you don't know us, my name is Ilza, and I'm also part of the Hot Topics team. And then we've got Cloni right over here, who is also one of our Hot Topics members. So the first episode that we're going to look at tonight as part of our best of 2020, as we reflect on the series, My Church or Your Church, is the introductory episode. It was a really interesting series that we looked at what does it mean to be a church? Why do we have so many different expressions and what is it like to be part of a church and to have these different forms of worship? So this first episode we looked at, we spoke about the idea of theology. Now Jackie in particular mentions practical theology, how what we do as a church informs what we say and who we are and who we become, but also how we worship, how that informs what we stand for as a church. So it's really a very interesting episode as we look at these different expressions of church. And I think just with what Jackie speaks about, Eels, it almost helps us understand why our churches take different views and stances on various things because that's obviously informed by our journey. It is informed by our theology. It is informed by the stuff that we want to emphasize as a denomination, but also as a church campus, a society, as some would put it, that is located in a particular context Context at a particular time. There are issues that would be important to us that we want to speak about that might not necessarily be important to the next church across the road. Absolutely, and that's sort of like what we stand for and how that informs our style of worship as well. So maybe you want to have a look at this episode. You, you, you speak about the power of our experience of worship and just how, how I suppose different things hold that. And over the last couple of years, I mean, I sit and I listen to the churches that you've pastored, and I think to myself, oh my goodness, I only have three on my list. And like, that, does that make me a bad minister, you know? But one of the things that's fascinated me in this journey of, of the expression of worship is, you know, what, what is the definition of church? What is church, particularly in the 21st century? Um, and there were a group of theologians who got together focusing on the practice of theology and practical theology, which is like an interesting, you know, kind of 21st century thinking about theology. Yeah. And they spoke about four things. And they spoke about there are normative aspects of theology that get passed down pretty much like the creeds, like the Deum, And we hold them. We hold them as if they are the norms that become our constructs. Mm -hmm. And so asking, you know, well, what are the norms that we really hold to? And I do think that norms are different in, in different expressions of worship, but they are norms, like our doctrines and our creeds. And it seems as if we're, we are holding similar norms across all denominations, you know. And then there are what, what, what creates the formalities around our worship, which is our style of worship. We sometimes get confused that our churches are defined theologically and doctrinally by the styles. They're not. It's just an expression of theology, being a formative expression expression of theology that forms those people for, for, for any set time, you know, that that becomes the expression. But the piece that obviously I've been interested in is the definition of what becomes your espoused and your operant expressions of worship. You know, how do we operate and, and what is it that we say about what we do? Because um, is our worship what we, is the way we worship, is that the theological essence of who we are as a community, as a church. And I think COVID has really forced us into a reimagination of that. You know, we've not been able to gather in in a way that we would usually have gathered. So, you know, it's not really shifted our norms because normative stuff is just, you know, in fact, very often the normative stuff holds us in these places. Like the, I mean, I've often read about how the 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 liturgy, the liturgy, the lectionary holds the our pieces of humanity together 
when we're fractured by world events. So those are critical. But it's the espoused and the operant. And I think that's what I've enjoyed, you know, most about a, a new church. You know, for, for me, it's like, you know, are you legitimate because you are new? Because I do believe that that's the question that you kind of raise. Let's start a new church. And strangely enough, I, I'm not, I would, I would love to be a Catholic, you know, but I'm just saying, it's like there's, there's a sense of, that sense of connected belonging is important. So I do think, and as a Methodist church, we, whether we like it or not, we are a split off based on all sorts of other reasons, you know. And so there is always a temptation in our ego to go in that direction. And I, I, I mean, personally, I think as a minister, that's the great struggle, you know. I think that the, the, the structures of the church do not serve us well, you know. I think that, and I'm not talking about the Methodist church in particular, but structure doesn't serve us, you know. Um, and, and when I think of Wesley, I think that he, he, he's becomes this prophetic mission driver and everyone who follows in the leadership of any hierarchical structure tries to force themselves into that mantle but end up doing administration and report on efficiency and that's not where the church is effective you know so yeah sure thank you so much Great. So that was the first episode of our series. And the next episode we had in our series was one on spiritual gifts. This was definitely a very interesting episode as well. With spiritual gifts, we find different expressions in different churches. Sometimes we have very prevalent giftings in some churches. and other churches, we don't even see the presence of spiritual gifts in a way that we understand it necessarily. And I suppose what sometimes makes it difficult for us to see the presence of Holy Spirit, I mean, uh, spiritual gifts, um, is that we've got this expectation of superhero abilities and then suddenly we're no longer normal human beings and we do these amazing things. But the truth is, if we were to search deeply, each and every person that is part of a faith community has something to offer, has a gift to offer to that community. Exactly. And what I found so interesting about this part of our episode was that we spoke about what does it mean to use our giftings. As people, we can sometimes be tempted to use these, you know, like almost supernatural abilities for mm -hmm. our own good. But if we reflect, it's actually we're given these abilities for the benefit of the congregation, the community, and that we have to walk humbly with our giftings. And that was just something that really stood out for me in this episode. So maybe let's have a look at this episode together. You know, those are difficult conversations. The temptation is always there to just write people off, but the truth is funny agendas can creep into our hearts and to our minds. So I think how we actually manage it, number one, you know, for me, I think it is very important to, to hold one another accountable. Mm. There are moments Good. when I, will, I might act and behave like a fake prophet, but the beauty of belonging to a community is accountability. And that's why we insist that gifts cannot exist in isolation. Mm. Belong to a community where they'll be channeled and developed towards the right direction. Absolutely. And I think it's important with this to remember is that we grow within our callings. We grow within our giftings as well. You know, at first you might start out using your gifting in the purest form and, and as life affects you and you might start to find yourself swaying, but that doesn't mean it's only there. I love what you said is we don't write people off because of a mistake they've made. You know, the aspect of grace is that although, yes, we have to call people out on it and say, mm, that's maybe not the right way to use your gift of prophecy. Or you're using tongues to have everybody look at you and go, wow, that's amazing. But that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't make you a just a false prophet. You are still a person. You still have infinite value to God. And you need to just find a way to kind of just get a little bit of back on track with it. So I think one of the ways is to remember with your giftings is, it's going to sound so cliche, but to stay humble within using your giftings, to really use it humbly. I mean, I, I think maybe I've got the gift of teaching or something like that. It would be great to be able to walk into a room and go, cool, I've got the gift of teaching. I don't need to prepare. God has given me this gift. I'll just get there. I'll just talk, and there we go. But that's not the way. I'm called to use my gift humbly and to glorify God and not myself. So if I prepare, I put in the effort, and within that, I still then use God to uh, allow God to work through my gift. That's probably the best way to do it. I'm just going to wrap us up. We only have a few minutes left. And I just wanted to say that 
I wanted to just quick, quick, quickly read from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I do not have faith that can move mountains, but do not, oh, and have faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I'm nothing. If I have all I possess to the, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I have nothing. So, as we spoke about spiritual gifts, we continue with the expression of what does it mean to look different in churches and use our giftings differently. Now, we also had to acknowledge the diversity of our churches, and this was in our conversation on church hour, the most segregated hour of the week. Now, some of you guys might find this or rather might hear this as a familiar statement. And yes, it comes from a statement that was made by Martin Luther King. But another important statement that he says in speaking about church diversity is is that he says, anyone who works against integration works against the spirit of God. But in this particular topic, we acknowledge this. But also what we then go on to do is we then almost explore uh, through our conversation with Paul Clanty and Bishop Faith Whitby, uh, we go on to explore this tension between existing as a diverse community, but also continuing with other conversations that are happening in exclusive communities. In this instance, we speak about the Black Methodist Consultation, which is an exclusive space for black Christians to speak about their experience in the church and to also just unpack other theological issues and political issues. Absolutely. I think the thing that stands out for me in that episode is it's a journey of becoming. We are by no means there, even in our society, but we intentionally work towards something. And so it's looking at where we find ourselves, where would we like to be, and how are we becoming as a church intentionally. And I love what you just mentioned, Els, because it really speaks into the clip that we're just going to show now, where the whole idea is we do not sleep one day having decided that we're going to be an integrated community and suddenly we wake up to a perfectly integrated community. But we need to explore both spaces, the space of an integrated community that is becoming, but continue engaging other issues that may still need people who are oppressed to continue reflecting and seeing how they can move the church forward from their experiences. So check out this conversation where we speak about this tension between diverse spaces and exclusive spaces. So, you know, there is the need for integration. We definitely need it, without a doubt. You know, but I um, read an exciting article written by um, one of our ministers, namely Ndikom Chiselwa, in celebrating the existence of the Black Methodist Consultation. And what he cites as one of the reasons, or rather two of the reasons that we still need an exclusive black space, is that we still need to engage in equality in the church. You know, he says that is still a, 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 an important reason, but also we need to eradicate the traits of colonialism that exist, that still exist in the church. He makes examples of hymn 245 in Tosa, which says, which is a very un African thing to say, guide me. It would rather be guide us, you know? And so there are these values that are being forced down people's throats. And so you need an exclusive space where you're going to engage those things without feeling inferior, without feeling as though there's a louder voice in the house. With, you know, so how do we then, um, you know, um, before Ilse wraps it up for us, in two seconds from everyone, how do we then continue to engage the in need of integration but holding it with attention of the other spaces that we need? like spaces that will continue to engage on issues such as why on earth does the Tosa hymn book still start by demonizing black people and saying when he, uh, when the heathen, why do we still have those issues? Now, how do we hold those two tensions? We, we certainly need to identify areas that need to be changed. That's important. And we take necessary resolutions to change that. Surely there's something wrong with our hymn book still referring to Kumkani Kazu Elizabeth uh, uh, um, centuries later and as if it is printed in Britain when it is printed here in South Africa. So we really have not done what we ought to have done. And so part of working towards integration is to admit we should have done this, we didn't do it, who is going to do it when, and there's some kind of accountability. 
Two, and lastly, I agree we still need some of the exclusive spaces to reflect on what it means to be black and the damage that has been caused by colonialism and, and apathy. What, what, what damage has it caused without any interference from someone else to interpret my experience? We need to experience what that means and interpret what that means for us and what solutions can we seek together. In my view, these can coexist without tension. There must be transparency. If I'm going to a black murderous consultation, my superintendent always know that I'm going to this meeting. And if he wants the agenda, I can share the agenda. And that's it. There is transparency. But at the same time, there is freedom in me reflecting on what I believe is important for us to, to look at. So we've got to work towards integration. There's power in humanism, interfaith, and we increase social action so that we are more visible in the community than we are visible in the sanctuary. The community pulpit must take a higher place in our priority list than the sanctuary pulpit. Thank you. Just very briefly from me, I think the word tension is helpful. And I do think we need spaces of challenge and engagement with one another, but also spaces of reflection and being able to speak in a voice that is heard, that is recognized. And how we manage that is an ongoing journey. The one doesn't necessarily exclude the other. We might at this stage in our history need both those spaces um, as we journey towards a deeper understanding of what it means to be one in Christ. So I do believe that the BMC, as it's abbreviated, is a gift to the church. But let me just say, I suppose this comes from my memory. The Bruderbund, which eventually became a very, very potent weapon in the whole racist journey, and we've got to recognize that, actually came from Afrikaners deciding that they wanted to group together against British colonialism. And ultimately it became a vicious instrument of assertion. And so I suppose two things. There is a challenge to the BMC that it, at the back of its mind, has got to keep very carefully in check that power in all of our hands is a very, very tricky gift that can ultimately build or destroy. And so the Afrikaner got, its, got their identity all sorted out and their ultimate target was not decolonization. Their ultimate target became the black community. And they eventually became the victims of a most outrageous victimization. And one has to be careful that that, that can happen. Just as it happened with whites a long time ago. But the second thing, I want to give a challenge to the BMC. And the challenge to the BMC is that there is an enormous educational task that needs to take place, primarily from, from black to white. Many whites don't see themselves as ignorant, and they are ignorant. They actually do not understand the profound nuance of the cultures of black people. And black people need to stand up and say, these are the things I learn in my culture. And the values that come from essentially being black. Not the old hackneyed Ubuntu and Gumuntu and Gabantu thing. We know all about that. But there are some very, very specific teachings. Very specific that we need to learn from one another. And it would be very wonderful, I think, if the Black Methodist Consultation targeted as part of their education program whites and coloreds with respect 
and Indians in the church. So that when we talk about becoming one, it's not just that we have a fancy way of singing and shaking in church together. But there is a very d deep, deep, deep understanding and respect of one another. And when you talk about a community pulpit, I mean, that begins to start opening up the imagination of how you begin to start spreading the word in a new way. That was a great conversation. And moving on from that conversation, we then went on to reflect with Pezile and Christine Laidlaw, Dr. Christine Laidlaw, um, about church being on the wrong side of history. You know, and in this, there is a moment where we begin to speak about the consequences of standing up against injustice, that it comes at a cost for individuals but also for the church. It's definitely something that's difficult to do. You know, you find yourself in the more popular circles. You don't want to find yourself on the margins. Most people would generally prefer to be in that. And so we find ourselves at a church, at a place where we have to make a decision, where are we going to find ourselves? And that's what this episode spoke about. It's for me, is where do we find ourselves? Do we find ourselves on the right side of history, the wrong side of history, in the margins or in the crowd? And it comes at a cost. And that's something Christine also speaks about. She then says, we need to draw from within. You know, our social justice witness is informed by our personal journey with God. And so in our personal journey, we need to acknowledge that there's going to be persecution yeah. and act from that place that we, it's not going to be nice. We're going to have people that are going to look down on us. But then Pezile then also goes on to speak about how this is also a reality for the corporate church, the gathered body, that people vote with their wallets. When you speak about stuff that upsets people, they vote with their wallets and they vote with their feet and they leave. So it means that the church needs to accept all these realities. And I must say, a scripture that came into mind as, we, as, 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 as they were speaking about that in that particular episode is when Jesus says, if he was persecuted, are we expecting to not be persecuted as his servants? It's a no-brainer. It will happen. So check out this conversation, church on the wrong side of history again. And so maybe then just moving on from there, how then do we engage? Um, so I remember chatting to one of the guys who was here on Hot Topics. They say church is a space where we are called out of the community so that we can speak into the community. Called out so that we can speak into the community. And one of my wrestles, I remember as a youth pastor at, um, used to be at Brackenus Methodist Church, which is a very old white suburb with changing demographics. But a lot of our black Methodists who resided in, 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 in Brackenhurst would go to the nearest township, which was Togoza, okay. as opposed to worshiping in Brackenhurst. But the challenge came where, when you engage with some of the young people from those families, when you realize that the constant migration to Togoza robs them of an opportunity to engage issues around race okay. within their community. Because when we're at church and we're doing church together, when the integration is not the kind that silences the other, mm. to say, you keep quiet, this is the culture here, but when we have real conversations, mm. it equips them to engage racial issues at school. Mm. But when there's the constant migration on a Sunday, it takes that away from them. Mm. And we could say that this is also true in instances where we've created exclusive communities to the point that we've taught people to not sacrifice their interest. Yeah. To the point that in Randburg, I think it's at Randburg, where there's a deaf community, there's a deaf church. Yes, that's mm. Because we are exclusive. As opposed to saying, sacrifice your preference. Mm. Where you might be irritated by the idea of there being someone interpreting in sign language. You might be irritated by the idea of not having wooden pews because they're exclusive to people who use wheelchairs. So saying sacrifice your interest and your preference, whereas you might be irritated by the idea of having someone who's, who's, who's still wrestling with their sexuality in the community. As a result, we now have a gay church. Are we going to continue with exclusive spaces because we don't want to do the hard work? I, I definitely think there's a difference between having exclusive spaces um, 
for example, the, the homosexual church and for, for the deaf. We, we did, I did a project, I did a bit of research on how could we make our church available and give opportunity to, to the deaf community. And I think from just from an expense point of view, to have someone who is signing is huge. You know, now it's not just one signer for the, the sermon, because now what do you do during worship? How do you worship together? What's happening if that family has a child with a hearing difficulty? So you need someone at children's church. And, as, so, and, and I know it's, it sounds silly to bring it to money, but resources is, is important when it comes to something so specific. And so perhaps it is easier to have a church where that is almost one of the aims of the church, is to have a place where people with hearing difficulties can feel a part but I then think it's very important in your geographical area to be doing things together whether it's outreach whether it's fellowship um, whether it's doing a course together that that you make accommodations for um, Lauren I, 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 know. I struggle with what you just said I, I know I you genuinely do, do. <laughs> I, I genuinely struggle with what you just said mm. you know because I think we almost saying it's not a worthwhile investment. I doubt we do not have the resources, you know. So for yeah. instance, um, we tried in our old community to run a disability Sunday, disability friendly Sunday every year, where it's an opportunity for us as a congregation to really on that week would in, inspect the facilities and all of that and look at all of that, you know. Um, but I don't know. I see we, we're really running out of time. But I struggle with us saying we do not have the resources. Because I think as a denomination, if we could put in effort, it would not only be a burden to the society, but we'd make it a point that even our buildings and everything we do is it somehow inclusive to different people. So that is very interesting because people are so unique and so different. So as soon as you're going, okay, well, we've got something for the deaf. We've got something for the visually impaired. We've got something for those in wheelchairs. What about those that, you know, not that it's that frequent, but two people that are built are, are linked by the hips. Now we can't have individual chairs. Now we have to have a double chair for them. And so all of a sudden, if you're taking each person as an individual who walks through that door, you almost have to say, please fill out all your preferences, all your life stories so that we can make this church about you. And, and I think I struggle with that because church shouldn't be about me as an individual. It should be unity in a community. So if you come to church and you're in a wheelchair and you go, oh, this church has pews, hopefully someone in the congregation, and I think this is important, congregation, not staff, sees that as an opportunity to befriend someone and to partner with them and to disciple each other. And I think it comes back to that relationship. So, you know, if, if there's someone who is deaf and comes in, say, well, uh, can, I, can I sit with you afterwards to make sure that you understood everything? And I think for me, that's where the unity and community comes in. It's in the people interacting, not necessarily what the church is providing. The church is the community. It is the people. And I think that's where it has to start with each of us as individuals. Um, look, Lynn, I think you are, you are right, and I partly agree with you, that we need to work hard to ensure that ultimately we build a community that is inclusive, the community where people can feel belonging and not fitting in. All right? So I think that that's the difference for me. Um, the difficulty is that most of our churches are structured and built in such a way that people want to fit in. You know? Hence, you find them opting, uh, opting to withdraw and go and create their own communities where they can belong. Because if, they, for example, we pick on the LGBTQI community, being part of most of our traditional conservative churches, they find it difficult to belong, you know, because of this the deep entrenched sense of exclusionary ways that we do church. And so people opt to go and belong somewhere else. And however, I mean, our Wesleyan theology calls upon us that 
it is inherent in our beliefs and our doctrines that we are a community of acknowledging and recognizing that everybody has been created in the image of God. And so that's the essence of who we are. And therefore, in everything that we do, we ought to be coming from the premise where we say um, everybody can belong here. But the truth of the matter is not the case. And that's what we need to work towards. That's the ideal, you know. And the question is, if that does not happen, what do we do with people who are struggling to belong in these communities? You know, I think that's the hard work that we need to be doing. And so our liturgical material needs to be structured in such a way that it is inclusive. All right. Our spaces need to be uh, deconstructed or decolonized, if one can use that. You know, demythologizing of our spaces can be a way in which we say, even if you come from whatever culture, from whatever social background, you will still have a home, you will still belong, you will still be loved, you will still be embraced, you will still experience all the fundamental principles that you would have to experience in the kingdom of God. You know, and that's what the church needs to be all about. And so that will have to go with transforming how we think and understand what church is. And understand that it should be a space that reflects and resembles the kingdom of God where everyone can be part of it. I think what comes to mind after that is two things. One, I think of, um, you know, as South Africa, we say our motto, our slogan is unity in diversity. Mm. How we don't say there has to be, everyone has to be the same. You don't have to fit in to belong. Yeah. You belong within your diversity. Yeah. And that's the first thing. The second thing that comes to mind is the scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, where it speaks about we are one body, mm. but many different parts. How we all belong to each other despite our different functions, our different ways of expressing, our different styles of worship. We all belong. And that it isn't, maybe we're not achieving it as it should be at this point, but that there is hope for us, but it is going to require work. And that's it from this particular episode where we were focusing on the church, my church or your church. So we covered four episodes and you can go check them out if you want to see them in full length. If you want to check out the full episode, it's on our YouTube channel. And we covered four episodes. We've covered church, uh, my church, or your church intro, spiritual gifts, church hour, the most segregated hour of the week, and church on the wrong side of history. That's what's up. It's been great having you join us and we hope that you'll join us again next week as we look at yet another series from 2020 that we really enjoyed and just highlight some moments that we really thought were critical for the journey that we're on as a church and personally as well. And so we hope you have a wonderful week and we will see you again next week. Mm -hmm.